Hello developers, my name is Matt Rabel and today I'd like to show you how to build a Spring Data resource server with JPA and OAuth. Let's get it up! Spring Data is an umbrella project that has many sub-projects that implement different features. You can see there's JDBC on the left there, LDAP, JPA, Mongo, Redis, and so it's a huge project that encompasses all of these implementations. Today we're just going to concentrate on JPA, which is Java Persistence Architecture, and it will be using Hibernate under the covers, but you don't really care about that because we're just going to have a few annotations and make everything work with the REST API pretty easily. This screencast is based off a blog post that we published on the Okta developer blog. You can see it here by Andrew Hughes, build a secure Spring Data JPA resource server, and you can see all the steps that we're going to follow. At the bottom of this blog post, there is a link to a GitHub repo that has the completed code, and in here I have a demo script that just consolidates the steps in the blog post. They're easy to read for a screencast like this. So you can see it's written here in ASCII doc. I have an ASCII doctor plugin installed. So I'm going to put this on the left there. And you'll see there's a few prerequisites. Java 11, HTTP, it's hard to say, and the Okta CLI. So we'll put our terminal on the right here, bump the fonts a little, and see if we have Java 11. Yep, uh, HTTP Pi, yep, and the Okta CLI. So if you don't have the Okta CLI, you can get it from cli.okta.com. And on that page is instructions for installing with Mac OS, with Windows, and with Linux. And so you'll see, here's the various steps. We're going to bootstrap a JPA project, and then we'll create a dinosaur domain model, create a Spring Data repository for that. We'll test it, and then we'll make it into an OAuth 2.0 resource server. So you can see here, the first steps are take Spring Data demo. And take is just consolidation of like make dir and cd, so it does both. It creates a directory and cds into it. And then we can run octa start spring boot. So this will pull from a, a sample repository that we have. And you see that it writes the configuration for octa into this properties file. And it does create a new open id connect application on octa. So we can cd into that spring boot directory. And then we can cat this file just to show you what that looks like. So these are read by the Okta Spring Boot Starter. It leverages Spring Security, and it's just a thin layer on top of Spring Secure to add a few features to make it a bit more secure, like audience validation. And you can see we have an issuer, client ID, and a client secret. This client secret is something you never want to check into source control. In fact, once I'm done with this screencast, I'll go and delete the app so you couldn't use it maliciously. But the client ID is just like a license plate for a car, so not a big deal if you check that one. So we can run this now, MVN Spring Boot Run. And then we can log in at localhost 8080. And since I'm already logged in, single sign-on just gets me right in. If I wanted to do it in an incognito window, then it would prompt me for my credentials. And then it will take me back to my application. So that's all using OpenID Connect and OAuth flows. If you want to know more about that, I recommend you check out this illustrated guide to OAuth and OpenID Connect. This is written by our friend David Neal. And it's got a bunch of cool pictures that really explain the process. And he does a video as well. So you can certainly learn how OpenID Connect and OAuth work from that. We're going to just get right along here and write some code. So I'm going to open this project up in IntelliJ. And the redirect to the hosted login form is a default behavior when you create a new Spring Boot application with Okta CLI. But we're going to change that so it's a JWT resource server where you'll just get a 401 back instead of a redirect if you try to you know, hit any endpoint. And if you pass a JWT, a valid JWT to that endpoint, then it will go ahead and authenticate you. So the first thing we're going to do is create a security configuration. So in the source main Java directory and the sample package, create a new Java class and we'll call it security configuration. And so you'll see there is a little shortcut here that I'm going to use. This is a live template that I pre-recorded and I do have my live templates available. So if you said Matt Rabel live templates, you'll get a GitHub repo that has all my IntelliJ live templates. And so you could import these live templates for yourself. So in here, I'm just going to type SS config allow, and then it'll spit out all that code for me. Isn't that handy? And so you can see here, we just have authorizing requests and we're allowing all since we've already configured this app to use Okta for security, we want to say, hey, you know, let's just do some testing first and not actually lock everything down. So in the simple REST controller in the application class, 
we want to make this so if there's no OIDC or no authentication happening, this will actually return null. And so we want to make that a little more friendly here by replacing it with this line. So it'll basically say hello if it's there. And if not, then I'll say, you know, hello anonymous. The process is probably not going anymore there. We'll, uh, we'll start it just from IntelliJ. And so now we can use HTTP pi to hit that endpoint and you can see hello anonymous right that's all working so now let's create a dinosaur domain model so what the world needs right now is some gigantic prehistoric monsters so in order to, to demonstrate spring data jpa we'll create a dinosaur domain novel model and the dinosaur repository so to begin we'll add some dependencies to our maven pom.xml file spring data depths is my shortcut and you'll see the added spring data jpa spring data rest and h2 for the database just because that's easy and i don't have to set up anything on the back end and then lombok just for some shortcuts so we don't have to write quite as much code and then we'll create a dinosaur data model class and if you do use lombok like this tutorial does you do need a lombok plugin for your ide so if this doesn't work or you get any errors you have to actually configure that and turn on annotation processing so i'm going to create this in a dinosaur class And you'll see we have Lombok, we have the persistence, and you might be wondering, why isn't it importing that? Well, IntelliJ doesn't, for the latest versions, don't import automatically. You'll see this little thing up here. You have to click it, and then it'll re-import that pom.xml and know that you have new dependencies, and then everything results. And so we just have, you know, getters and setters and a NOR constructor. Lombok does that for us. Let me actually create this again. And now it's got shorter imports name fangs because you want to know if they have fangs number of arms because there's some freak show dinosaurs out there and then their weight in tons which obviously could be a lot here's a funny part from the blog post and this was written by andrew not by me so these are his words and i thought it'd be fun to share so these dinosaurs aren't really wreaking havoc in your head but you need a way to create read update and delete these dinosaurs and don't forget delete that's a mistake that movie made and if they had used spring well they would have gotten deleted automatically for free, and it might not have been much of a movie, but many more people would have survived. So create a dinosaur repository. And the cool thing is this is from Spring Data JPA, and we can make it a CRUD repository just by extending CRUD repository. And then it'll prompt us for the types, and we'll say we have a dinosaur, and it's got an ID of long. Right, And the reason it's not compiling is because it needs to be an interface. And if you have an interface, then it doesn't need to be public because all interfaces are public. And now we can test this REST resource. So we can restart Spring Boot here. And you'll notice I'm actually using Java 15 and IntelliJ and Spring Boot 2.4 works just fine with that. So that's pretty handy. And we can type, you know, 8080 dinosaurs. And there aren't any. Well, what do we do wrong? Ah, I know what it is. So you need a REST repository annotation. I probably forgot that on the dinosaur repository. And now that's what makes it RESTful. Now if we restart, then it'll expose this entity with create, read, update, and delete methods. So you need that annotation on there, it won't happen. Now if we go here, you can see it's returning a hot EOS response and how for the formatted data. So there's no data in there, but you know, that is working. And how's a descriptive resource language that uses to publish links. So a lot of times there won't be like IDs in the response. It'll be links to the uh, endpoint that has that entity and you can hide certain cred methods so if i were to add exported equals false on that entity on that interface then it would disable the rest resource or not adding it at all like you saw that works as well and then if you only want to hide certain methods you can do that in this case let's disable the delete methods for the dinosaurs and cue maniacal laughing and hand wringing <laughs> grab all this configuration here and so this is going to do a few different things it's going to disable delete right on that by exporting false and you notice there's two delete methods delete by id and just delete the whole entity and then down here what we're going to do is expose those ids just to make it a little easier for any clients so we'll save that we'll stop this and restart it oh and we also want to get some data in here so new file data.sql put some you know sample dinosaurs in here a terror bird an ankylosaurus and a spinosaurus. These are mutated dinosaurs, not actual dinosaurs. So some of them have extra arms. Now, if we look at our dinosaurs again, you'll see we have a full listing of dinosaurs. And if we were to try to delete one, 
it'll say 405. So I know it's hard to read, but highlight it. It's not so bad. And that's method not allowed, right? We deleted those methods, so you can't do that. And so to avert disaster, you will want to, you know, add those back in, back to our dinosaur repository. And uh, you do want to be able to delete dinosaurs because those suckers can be dangerous. Restart, try again. And now it works. 204, which is basically saying it worked. I got no response. Crisis averted, right? So we're doing well there. The only thing left to do is secure the whole thing so random foreign net bots aren't creating dinosaurs willy-nilly. So thanks to Okta Spring Boot Starter, most of OAuth is already in place and we need to update that security configuration to authorize all requests as JWTs. So we'll go back to IntelliJ here and that security configuration. And so we're just gonna take out this ant matchers permit all and say any request needs to be authenticated. And then we want it to be a resource server and accept JWTs. And that's it. Pretty easy to change the configuration there. And then, like I said earlier, we have all this configuration for Okta in our application.properties, and we can restart. And this time, it'll be locked down. We go to just dinosaurs. You can see we're getting a 401, right? We aren't allowed to access that because it's secured. So we can get an access token JWT using the OIDC debugger. It's a website that we've set up that allows you to get an access token. But first you'll have to add a new login redirect URI to your Okta app. So if you type Okta login, Okta CLI will spit out a URL where you can log into. And then if I were to go to my applications, this is the one it created and I can edit and add a new login redirect URI. All right, so now we have OIDC debugger in there, back to our instructions. So we have to go to the OIDC debugger. Now I've already used it before, so it has, well, it's got some defaults in there. I'm using a different browser profile, so it doesn't have it, but we'll need to copy this for the authorize URI. And then mine is dev five five nine two seven two four the better thing might be to do go to your api authorization servers because this is what you really want right here so when you go into right here and copy and paste that and that's the authorized endpoint and then we'll need the client id that was right here and Scope doesn't matter, you do need open ID in there. You can just do one, two, three, anything for the state. And we want to get a code back. So we'll send that request and it gives us a code. And now what we have back in the instructions, we need to send a request to get the access token. So right here, we're going to have to modify this a bit to have our values in there. So authorization code that was back here. Copy, put it right there. And then our client ID and our client secret. And then we should be able to use HTTP to send this. And we get back that access token. So now we can take this access token and set it to a local variable like this. Let me get the exact syntax here. We can use that just like this in a request and we're authenticated. So everything's working. If we want to delete or add new ones, right, that would all work with that access token. And this is a great tip. If you uh, if you try to go to the main endpoint, you'll see it's got a 401. Let's try it with that token. And you'll see it says hello anonymous. So that's not working. And that's because it's a different type of authentication when you're using JWT. So it has OIDC user in there now, and we want to change it to a JWT principle. So it's still an authentication principle, but it's just a different type now. So delete that out of there. So that's not used right in this simple REST controller. We can change this to be that JWT principle and import that from, yep. And then if we use that same name, we just get the subject, which is usually the email, or it can be a unique identifier. It kind of depends on the access token that's being sent in. Now we'll try it again. And you'll see now it returns the email. If you liked this tutorial, you can find all the code on GitHub there on the Okta Developer GitHub repo. And of course, read the blog post here. If you enjoyed this screencast, I would invite you to follow my team on Twitter at OctaDev. I'm on Twitter at MRabel. And subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can watch more kick-ass videos like this one.